Uh, that is an absolutely beautiful way of keeping each other in our in our jaws, inshallah, and in such a difficult time. Jazakumullah khair again. I have to tell you guys, and I um, you know, inshallah, I'm going to be introducing our 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 other MC, Hina. Assalamualaikum. I had so much to say, but I'm just I'm I'm blown away. I'm pretty much in tears. Everyone who knows me knows I'm a sap for, and I just need an excuse to cry. And right now, I'm just I'm just shocked and amazed. And thank you both, Sister um, Arena, Sister Yasmin. Your passion is reflective, um, and I bl I hope that you both are blessed with even more donations. I wish more success for Nisa Homes Charity, and may Allah Taala uh, bless bless this work that you do. It's so important in our community right now, and. Um, I hope that you, you've already achieved your goal. I hope that you exceed your goal tonight and yeah. every night. And Allahu Akbar. I want to share, uh, subhanAllah, uh, Sister Yasmin was saying that, you know, people are, you know, asking why Nisa Homes? Like, why do you need a Muslim, you know, women's shelter? I worked in the shelter system. I worked in over uh, 40 shelter system, working with those that are dying. Um, and I met Muslims that are dying in the shelter system, women that, that are dying with their children around them with, with you know, end stage cancer. And, you know, subhanAllah, when they see me as a hijabi woman coming in, how their faces would light up because they didn't get that. No one understands why they want to read Quran or why they're trying to pray and why they need a clean space and why they need their own space for prayer. Like these little things that we sometimes take for granted that Nisa Homes is able to provide these women. Like I'm, I'm personally blown away. I just thank Allah for opening that door for all of us. Um, Hina, uh, I'm gonna be handing it over to, our, to her for the, the rest of the evening, mashallah. The speakers have been absolutely phenomenal. Jazakumullah khair for, for you know, keeping the, the hype going, everybody, and just keeping the energy going. Your comments have been absolutely uh, amazing, mashallah. And we have, uh, we have Hina now that's going to be taking uh, you all throughout the rest of the night, through the rest of the journey. Jazakumullah khair, everybody. Assalamu alaikum, Hina. <laughs> yes, Assalamu alaikum, everyone, and I hope that you have all been enjoying the wonderful speakers. I, I feel that I had so much to say and so much to share, but honestly, I'm, I'm silenced by all of the wonderful thoughts and knowledge that I have gained today, and I hope that this is something that I can take with me going forward and something that will help me change and grow and be someone better tomorrow. So in, inshallah, um, again, we still have a few more speakers left today and, and I hope that you continue to stay with us and enjoy today. So first I would love to introduce our next speaker, Sister Tasneem Alkiak. So Sister Tasneem completed her under, undergraduate degree in early Christianity and Islamic Studies at the University of Michigan. She's currently a PhD candidate in Islamic Studies at Georgetown University with a focus on the development of Islamic law. She also serves as the Director of Expanded Learning in addition to being a research fellow at Yakin Institute for Islamic Research, where she works on both writing about topics related to doubt and conviction, as well as curriculum and other resources for communities to engage with Yakin's research. So once again, let's welcome Sister Tasneem. Assalamualaikum everyone. I'm excited to be here with you guys all today. Um, and unfortunately not in person, but uh, this is, I think it was an amazing turnaround by the team, by the me, me team to ha host a whole online conference in such short notice. So thank you guys for inviting me. Thank you guys for doing this. I think it's a very much needed opportunity because obviously things are very different now. Um, and a lot of us might be nervous. A lot of us might be confused, not really sure how to proceed and all of that. And so I think it just takes an opportunity to just come together, discuss it all, you know, uh, sort of coop together up, you know, and, and really reframe our mindsets, our perspectives and energize ourselves, especially considering that technically next weekend is the last weekend before Ramadan. I was just talking to a friend about that and that just blew my mind. SubhanAllah, time flies. And I cannot believe, at least, I don't know about you Canadians, but for, for us in the US, uh, yesterday marked the first month of quarantine. Um, and, you know, subhanAllah, like the fact that it went by just what felt so slow, but incredibly quick. Um, and so it's just a reminder again that, you know, we're, we're nervous now, we're stressed or things are different and we're, we might be so uncomfortable with the change, but 
with the blink of an eye, the next few months will pass by inshallah. But the one thing we don't want to happen is this to pass by and we're exactly the same afterwards, right? This is obviously a challenge, this is a test. Even if you're not entirely affected, this is something that's inconvenient to you. Um, it's, still, uh, it's still a test that we need to pass, right? And when you pass a test, obviously you come out smarter, you come out stronger. So there's gotta be difference, right? And so that's, that's a really one thing that I wanna focus on. And I wanna focus on something very specific. I wanna focus on our relationship with the Quran in Ramadan. But before I get to that, I wanna talk a little bit about being productive in these times, right? So the majority of us are going to be at home, right? We're going to be at home or our, in, our routine is gonna be disrupted. Whether you're an essential worker and you do have to go to work, things are different, right? It doesn't matter if you're, you're working from home or from out, things, I mean, I just, I was at Target earlier, things are just shut down. There's like ghost lines and there's crazy lines and just, it's so bizarre and overwhelming. And every time I walk out to go get groceries or I'm at the park for, you know, to go uh, get a run in or something like that, I, I just, I look around, I'm like, you know, subhanAllah, like how, how something can disrupt your life. Like something so small, miniature, you can't even see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can change everything in literally, um, in something microscopic, right? Um, and so, the point in saying all of this is that this is something really unprecedented, right? We've never gone through this. I don't, I could never have imagined something like this. We've had so many different things come up, you know, Ebola, Zika, and everyone used to panic. And I think to myself, well, no, like what's going to happen, right? Where we live in, you know, in the U.S., you live in, the, in Canada, whatever place you're living in, that subhanAllah, we think that we're not going to be affected by this stuff, right? And it's, it's so humbling to see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can put us in our, in our place in, in, in really the most humbling of ways. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have done it in so many different ways where it could have been obvious or destructive or anything like that, but he, he chose the most smallest of some, something we can't even see to disrupt the whole entire world, right? Um, and, and in that, of course, our lives have been changed, but the, what we can do is really get back on our feet as quick as possible. And in order to do that, we want to be able to recreate a sense of routine. And, and this is something that I've been, you know, I've been emphasizing across the board, right? We want to maintain our productivity. When we're now at home, our kids are at home, our, you know, our families are yeah, separated, whatever it is, uh, things, it's really hard to fall back into your normal thing, your schedule, you know, whether you're studying, whether you're at work, whether you're a full-time mom, whoever, whatever it is that you do, things are 100% different, right? And so uh, just to share a couple of very big picture, you know, uh, suggestions to help recreate that sense of routine, it's something that's extremely relevant to Ramadan. And it requires two big steps, right? Number one, it's goal setting. And number two, it's scheduling your time as much as you can. Um, and so for the first one, this applies when I'm talking about goal setting, this, is, this applies to, you know, your work life, your school life, your family life, everything. But for the purposes of today, I want to focus on your spiritual goals because that is what we're going to be most concerned about in Ramadan. The reason I mentioned that this can work across the board, it can work for your, you know, your whole life, um, this, this process of creating routine, is because when our work lives are a mess, when our family lives are sort of a mess, you know, and by a mess, I mean it's just overwhelming, you're stressed out, you've got things to do, it, it really deeply affects your spiritual life, right? It's, it's very much connected. So you want to be able to have control over all of your, you know, as much control as you possibly can, of course, over all spheres of your, you know, your life domain, I guess. Um, and, and that really will enhance, they'll both work together to enhance your spiritual life, right? But like, as I mentioned, today we're focusing only on spirituality, right? And so one big thing you want to be doing, especially in Ramadan, this is something that, you know, we hear time and time again, but it's extra, extra important this year, right? Is you want to set a list of your goals. What exactly is that, do I want to achieve this Ramadan? Accepting the reality that, of course, things are different, right? Uh, things are not going to be the same. We're most likely will not be praying jama'ah, you know, in congregation at the masjid. We won't be having our massive iftars. We won't be, you know, our, our, where the whole community comes together to, to break fast, all of this stuff. And so reflecting on that, knowing that things are going to be changing and thinking about, okay, what am I, where am I going to be? What am I going to be doing? Um, and now with your, this whole new sort of entering this whole new Ramadan, thinking about your goals. And it's important to, to, to really confront the reality that this Ramadan, Ramadan is going to be different. Not in, a, not in a stressful kind of way, but facing a challenge head on, knowing that, you know what, this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted for us. This is something that he's testing us with and accepting that as a reality 
going into Ramadan and saying, and reframing it, not, and thinking not to yourself that this Ramadan is going to be awful. It's not going to be the same. I'm so sad, but thinking, you know what? I'm here for a reason. Things are different for a reason. And I'm going to come out of this stronger, right? Because right now we might be struggling. We might be facing, like feeling the heat, but give it a few months after this is all done. Give it till next year, inshallah. You're going to look back and think to yourself, you know, it wasn't that bad, right? Or no matter what comes at you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, illa you're, you're never going to face something that you can't handle. This is, this is a promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we all can handle it. There's no doubt, no matter how difficult your situation is. And, and people are being tested at much more severe levels than others. But that's because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what you can handle, right? So you, you, you've got this, right? You've got this. And now it's a question of you're going into Ramadan and you're, you're setting that mindset, that perspective, that despite that things are going to be different, I'm going to come out of this and I'm going to be strong. I'm going to look back in a few years. And when my kids and my grandkids and we you know what happened during the 2020 uh, pandemic, how did you survive? And it's down in history books and all of these things. And you're looking at your grandkids or whoever it is and say, no big deal. You know what? That was the best time of my life because I learned to create habits. I learned to create routine. I learned, you know, I, I, I accepted the challenge. I confronted the challenge head on and I came out with my head out high. Right. So inshallah, we all want to be in that, that, that position. And so now you, you, you have this optimistic mindset that I'm coming into Ramadan and that's fine, right? And keeping in mind that the companions, right? The, the concept of praying tarawih and jama'ah in congregation with, in a masjid is, you know, is post-prophetic in a sense, right? It's not, the Prophet the time, at the time of the life of the Prophet Sallam, they all prayed by themselves at home. So yes, as much as I absolutely love, love going to Masjid Ramadan for tarawih, I'm not going to come into this Ramadan thinking, I get to live like the companions. I get to live like the prophet. I want to experience the way they experience their Ramadans. I want to experience the way they experience their Islam, their connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And again, having that mindset of let's, you know, let's put our, 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 um, ourselves in their shoes and see how they, how they experience this time of year, right? So again, just think, re reframing constantly your perspective and, and, and thinking of different opportunities to be optimistic going in. You got a new schedule, you got new expectations, you've been thinking about what's going to happen, what's going to feel different this Ramadan, and now you're setting your goals. And for, you know, for, for a lot of you, it might be, okay, what am I going to do for Tarawih this year, right? We're not praying together. What is my alternative? You want to be thinking about what are the goals you can manage? How can I read more Quran now that I'm at home or can I read less because my kids are with me? Um, you know, uh, uh, am I going to be praying Tarawih with family? I'm going to be praying by myself. What, what are all the things that are going to be changing? actively sit down and write these down, right? When you think about it in your head, it's fine, right? Okay, it's progress, but you're, there's nothing to hold you accountable if it's all in your head. But when you have it written down and you can look back and tell yourself, wait, this is what I had planned. And then you come back and, 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 and you, know, you can hold yourself accountable. You can tell yourself, well, I told myself this. Why am I not following up with it? Versus if you said, well, I thought about it, but it's not like I really committed, right? Take yourself seriously, take your goals seriously and write them down. And so when it comes to, you know, I don't want to go into details because I do want to focus on the Quran. Um, but for example, even for tarawih, uh, don't undermine any of your actions, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that this is different. He knows this is challenging and he recognizes the effort that you're putting in. So even if you don't, if you're by yourself um, or with just your spouse or, you know, with your whole family, if that means you're getting up and praying eight rukahs or 20 rukahs and you're re reciting the same surah every single rukah, but if you're doing it, reflecting on the ayats, if you're doing it with the, the intention, the sincerity of, of replicating what would be tarawih in the masjid, you're going to get that ajit and so much more, right? This is all, I mean, when it comes to these promises, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very clear in the Quran, right? It's just about effort. It's about con contemplating on the ayat sincerity coming closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's all he wants, right? So I, I want to throw that out there that I'm not, you know, it's it's not going to be the same and it's okay if things don't feel exactly the same. If you're not doing a whole khatm, you're not completing the entire recitation of the Quran, that's okay, right? Um, and so uh, with all of that in mind, you want to be writing down your goals. Okay, what can I manage? What, you know, uh, what what's going to be different? What can I manage? And then writing them down. So now you have your goals in place, right? Uh, and this is going to take some time. Don't force yourself out. It's, it's always good to prep for Ramadan, you know, five days, 10 days, two weeks, as early as possible. Hopefully by tonight, inshallah, you'll have enough to prepare after listening to everyone. And you want to you, you write down those goals and now 
sort of split them up. What's going to be daily? What's going to be weekly? What's going to be the first 10 days of Ramadan, you know, second batch? Uh, and, and really just writing down as much detail as possible, again, in order to be able to say, hold yourself accountable. Not to stress yourself out when you don't meet those goals, but to, to be able to look back and say, I, I believed in myself. I knew I could do these things and then I could keep, I can keep myself accountable. I can hold myself accountable and, and, and always every day try again to, you know, to meet those goals. Then it comes to scheduling. And this is something that is extra important in Ramadan because a lot of times we feel lethargic, we feel tired, we feel, you know, we think of all these different excuses and I'm 100% guilty of this, right? Um, that, well, it's Ramadan and I'm fasting. So like, I don't have to do like my normal, like intense work schedule. I can just like take a nap midday. I can do all these things, which is fine if you have a schedule. Because when you go into Ramadan, when you wake up and you're fasting and it's 8 a.m., 9 a.m., 10 a.m., uh, whatever time it is, it's that if you don't have something in mind, you're sort of like slowly moving from one act to the other. It's like, okay, let me get out of bed now. Maybe I'll do my Quran now. Maybe I'll get food started. I don't know. We'll see, right? So you're spending so much time thinking about what you want to do that you're, you're wasting time in terms of what you can actually be doing. But if at the beginning of Ramadan and the beginning of every week, at, at, you know, uh, at the end of every night, whatever time frame works for you and is most effective for you, you're sitting down and you're writing to yourself tomorrow, every Monday, uh, you know, this is how every day of my week is going to look like on the weekdays, the weekends are going to look like this, whatever the case is, right? And you say every morning from 9am to 11am, I'm going, that's my work time. That's my whatever time. 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. That's my nap time. That's going to be me uh, cleaning, cooking. That's going to be me looking after, you know, doing puzzles with my kids, anything, right? The point is it doesn't matter what necessarily what you're doing in those block scheduling, the, the, those, those hour schedules, the two, three hour blocks. It's that you know that you have something to do, right? And again, it doesn't necessarily mean you're working 12 hours a day. You can schedule in naps. You can schedule in cooking times. You can schedule in if thought, whatever it is. But when you know you have something, when you have your day planned out, you're, you spend less time using the mental energy, thinking about what you want to do next and, and, and telling yourself, you're looking at your schedule and thinking, you know, you wake up at 9 a.m. and look at your schedule, it says 10 a.m. You've got something to do. You, you know exactly where you have to be and when you have to be at that time, right? And so you're not, you're, you're not thinking, okay, what am I going to do next? And then you're on Facebook for like 30 minutes scrolling. Let me watch this video, then this video, then this video. And then two o'clock rolls around. You're like, ah, what did I do today? Right. But when you have that schedule in place, you, you, the second you start wasting time on social media or you waste time, like, you know, walking in circles, whatever. I mean, sorry, I don't have kids. So I have the privilege of, of having a lot more time. So I apologize for a lot of people who can't relate to having the time to walk in circles, but whatever you're, you're you know, you're, you're, you're busy yourself with things that, are not necessarily you know the most conducive to your time right but when you have that schedule you can look back and tell yourself that hey i was supposed to be doing this now i just wasted 30 minutes doing my quran when i was supposed to be doing my quran again it's all about accountability so now that i've got that whole foundation really set in place is that you want to be thinking about your goals you want to accept the reality that things are going to be different and now you're creating schedules uh, again very general but skeletons of schedules to be able to, to hold yourself accountable, I wanna focus on specifically the Quran, right? Obviously Ramadan is the month of the Quran, it's an opportunity for us to connect, but I'm going to be extreme, I'm, we'll try to be as, as practical as possible. When it comes to the Quran, whether you're trying to memorize it, whether you're trying to read it for the first time, whether you're trying to anything, right? It doesn't matter what that goal is, it's applicable to anything. I want you to think of one goal, one manageable goal you can think of. Is it reading five pages a day? Is it reading 10 pages? Is it reading two lines? Is it, what is it? Think of that goal. Just act right now, think of like, what's the first thing that comes to your head? Like, okay, you know, I've thought to myself, I, I really wanna do something with Quran. You haven't necessarily set a goal. What's the first thing that comes to mind? You think to yourself, I know what's reasonable. I know, I know for a fact I can read half a juz every single day. And you're telling yourself this right now, right? I can read five pages every single day, got it. I can memorize two ayats every single day, got it. Whatever that goal is that you just thought of randomly, and you can give it more thought later, please give it more thought later. Cut it in half, cut it in a third, cut it in, lower that goal, right? So if you are convinced you can do 10 pages every single day reading, do, tell yourself, I'm gonna do five pages every single day. What's the problem? See, what happens is that a lot of people, especially because we're really excited for Ramadan, which is a great thing, 
We come into Ramadan, I'm going to do three khatim. I'm going to read the Quran three times. I'm going to do all of these different things. Day one comes around, and you're like, oh man, I kind of, kind of, you know, fell back on my schedule already. What happens? The next day, you're like, well, since, uh, you know, you've got, we have this all or nothing mentality that I kind of messed up on day one. Mm, maybe day two, let me try catching up. You don't catch up, then you just feel guilty, right? And then uh, what happens day three, day four, and you haven't caught up yet, you're like, forget it, I'm not doing any of this. So when I'm telling you, don't think about what, think about what you think you can do and then cut that in half. Because what happens is that, for example, say that you know you can read 10 pages every single day, but you, you hold yourself accountable to five pages. You're gonna try for those 10 pages. I'm not discouraging, for, uh, discouraging you from that by any means. But the days you can't get 10, you're gonna at least do five. You always wanna have the very bare minimum. Shoot for the stars, right? That, that's not the issue. Always try to do your best. But the days where you know, you're not feeling well, your kids are driving you crazy, something's happening, you, know, you can go to sleep and tell yourself, well, I got those five pages in. And there's a science behind it, right? The science in terms of creating habits in your life, when you don't get the reward from you, the routine you create, it, 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 um, it creates sort of, um, it turns you off, right? You, again, it's that, that sense of guilt and why well, I can't do it. And it, really there's these you know, sort of mind games that play with you. So maybe you didn't get your 10 pages in, but when you get your five pages in, you, can, you, th you still get that sense of reward, right? It's still, your brain clicks and thinks, well, I got in my five pages, I got in at least my bare minimum. And so it makes a huge difference. It can keep pushing you forward, especially on the days that sometimes, you know, you're not feeling well, you need a break. And sometimes you just, you get, you, things get, you get caught up with things. You can't meet your 10, you know, 10 pages, but guess what? You feel great doing five pages. And, and at the end of the day, if, if you can walk out having, you know, consistently done five pages every single day in Ramadan, you're still a winner, right? And, and one of the, you know, most amazing hadith and what the hadith that like I try to live by is where the Prophet he says, uh, that the best of actions, the most beloved of actions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are those that are consistent even if they're small. This is mind blowing, okay? If you've read any book on creating habits, any book on willpower, routine, anything like that, and I can list a few, a few recommendations, what do they all say? It's all about consistency. It's, I mean, it's just, you know, you read hadith and you think, wow, this is prophetic, this is great, amazing. And then you, there's certain hadith you read and you're just like, this is so real. Like Islam is so real. The prophet, like he, he got this, right? He knew exactly, he knew all the, all, all, all the really tr tricks, the way out, the, the solutions to, to all of these problems. Something so simple, right? Just consistency. And that's a goal that, you know, it's, this is, we're, we're in this for the long run, right? It's going to be past Ramadan, it's before Ramadan. If you can walk out of this, this, this experience, this pandemic, and you have only managed, I say only as if it's something like little, if all you've managed to do is create one habit of reading five pages of the of Quran every single day, and you take that to your grave, you take that for the next five, 10 years, just think about the, the, the incredible like amount of reward. Because again, it's, there's so many people I know that have, you know, they're like, you know, see, I'm going to start memorizing the Quran. Great. That's awesome. They set this unreasonable goal of trying to start memorizing. What happens in a few weeks in, a few months in, they, they haven't been able to create that sense of habit and that routine. And then, and then that's it. Then they give up. Well, I tried, I couldn't do it. And now I sort of quit. Right. And so I say all of this because number one, even again, if you, that's all you take to your grave is the, you know, reading five pages of Quran a day. It's incredibly magnificent, right? Don't undermine that. But for those of you who want a more serious, not, not, not more serious, not to undermine anyone else, but if you want a more intense relationship with the Quran and you want to memorize a certain surah, you want to memorize the whole Quran, you want to be able to read more, understand more, I promise you, starting small will take you miles, okay? Whatever, across the earth, whatever the expression is. Um, and... and what happens is you start reading, you know, two pages a day, five pages, whatever it is. What happens over time is that you start to fall in love with the Quran, right? You start to fall in love and you want to do more. Like, again, it's really this, it, it's called the habit loop. There's a really good book that I like. It's called The Power of Habit. It's called The Habit Loop, where you, you continuously, there's a cue. 
So say at, every single day after Fajr, I do my Quran, right? You and, the, and really, I do recommend this book, especially for those who want to memorize the Quran or create any other habit. But you 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 set a cue in your life where something happens. It's when you wake up. It's right before you go to sleep. It's a timing. It's a reaction. When I'm at the masjid, you know, there's various different types of cues. You read your Quran. You memorize your Quran. Then you get the reward. The reward of feeling good. I feel close to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. I feel spiritually energized. Then it pushes you back into that habit loop, right? So you. You, this starts off, you're reading a few pages, and then you find yourself like, wow, reading has gotten so much easier for me with practice, right? I'm going to now start memorizing a few lines, and, and I'm going to do more and more. And I know this sounds really hypothetical. A lot of people are like, well, Tazim, you're just saying that, you know, that's, no, that, that's exactly how I did it, right? This is, this is as real as I can be with you. I started off with my relationship with the Quran. I'm, I told myself, you know, I'm going to read a few pages every single day. Read a few pages, and I was like, this is getting easy, right? Let me jump it up to five, 10 pages over months, years, whatever it is. And then so how like you, you, you wake up and, and when you're, if your cue is reading after, you know, right when you wake up, you wake up and you, you just naturally fall into your habit, your routine. You start reading Quran, even when the days you're tired, the days you're groggy, the days you're exhausted. It's like your day doesn't feel like you started until you start reading Quran. That relationship grows. Don't undermine it. And that relationship can only grow if you're consistent and you create the habit, right? Once you've got that habit in place, it's just a matter of continuing before it just sort of snowballs and it gets more and more and more. And I know I'm almost out of time, so I just want to add a couple of more things. Is that um, number one, in terms of consistency, you, you, you pick a time of the day, right? Mornings, I mean, it's sort of like foolproof, right? It's the best time of the day. That, you know, it might not be a reality for a lot of you guys if, if you have maybe little kids and they wake you up in the morning. I don't know, uh, you know, whatever situation you might have. If it's right before you go to sleep, your kids are asleep, you know, you have time, that's your time. It's after Maghrib. It's, you know, just pick a certain time of day and be consistent with it, right? And again, there's there's different ways of motivating yourself, of establishing cues to set the stage of, of getting yourself there and keeping it going. And again, I do recommend reading more about creating habits in general, um, but find something that works for you. Maybe you already have something and you want to just make it consistent and work from there. Um, and and that, that I, if there are questions specifically about that for advice, I can go on to that. But just to wrap up, I wanted to add one more point is that um, read uh, the translation um, of the Quran. So when I first started memorizing, what, what I would do is I'd read three different translations, right? Because I was like, I'd read like Pickett Hall, Ali, whatever, all these, you know, typical ones. But by reading multiple translations per ayah, every translation's got like a little tweak, right? And so uh, so then you read the, you, you know, if one translation is kind of like, doth not say thou shall, whatever, you read the next translation, like, oh, okay, that's what it means, right? It, it, they all build upon one another. Read more than one translation per ayah. Um, of course, I mean, if you want, just if you want to stick to one, that's fine, start with one. But something that I found extremely beneficial is when I would do multiple translations. And then uh, as, as much as you can, there's always so many opportunities, especially in Ramadan, to listen to, you know, different tafsirs of the Quran. So explanations, the stories behind them. It's, it's the most like spiritually boosting experience, really. Um, but the reason why I say read the translation. So when I first started, I like building my relationship with Quran, it was right before high school. And my Arabic was not very strong. Um, I picked up uh, Arabic grammar and all that stuff much later in later high school and, and then college and all of that stuff. But it, it was crazy because I remember my like teachers later down the line were asking me like, you know, to seem like you didn't really go, you didn't grow up. I didn't used to go overseas and, and stay like, uh, with family trips. It was maybe I'd gone, you know, over to Arab countries a few times. It was never enough to build like a strong Arabic foundation and compared to like family members. My teachers would always ask me like, how, like where, where's your Arabic from? Like, how do you know so much, you know, Arabic words, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, for a while I was like, you know, I don't know, like maybe just I learned it over time. And then I realized when I went back to the Quran, before ever learning like Quran, like Quranic words are very different than like what would be typical modern standard Arabic, right? It's much deeper, much more, uh, you know, it's just, it's different vocabulary. Remember at one point after years of reading, just being consistently reading and then read, uh, reading the Arabi, memorizing the Arabi, and then reading the translations, because I had gone through it so many different times, reading so many different translations, I 
my like my Arabic vocabulary without me even trying. It wasn't like I was sitting down memorized, okay, Asama is this, Allah is this, what are you know, all these different words, these are this. But you just naturally pick it up. Like there's so many different perks of reading the Quran and reading through the translation. You'll learn so much Arabic, right? Just Arabic vocabulary in that time. Um, just just through that experience alone. So there's so many different things that come up when you memorize the Quran. It's it's really incredible. And it, I, I was reading a book a few months ago that it, a book I really recommend is it's called Deep Work by Cal Newport. And I'll end with this. Um, and it is crazy because his whole argument, right, is about, you know, if you really want to focus, you want to get more work done, you want to get like serious intellectual work done, you need to be able to go put yourself in a state of deep work where you're entirely focused and you have no distractions and, and then you can achieve blah, 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 you can get so much done. And I was thinking to myself, okay, this is great. Um, and he had it almost an entire chapter, like 50 pages worth dedicated to how to increase your memorizing ability. And literally it was, honestly, it was hysterical to me because what does he say? He says, well, you know, get a deck of cards and shuffle them and then memorize the numbers and then shuffle them again. And he, there was all these crazy techniques to increase your memorizing skills. And I'm here thinking to myself, like I could, all my memorizing level, my, like my, my intellectual, like my, my brain's ability to focus on something, because that's what it is when it comes to memorization, it's all about focus. My ability to focus compared to an average person is about a thousand times more because of what, like literally building a connection with Allah Taala through my, like working with the Quran. I could go on and on. I don't have enough time, but the amount of perks that I realize, like going on as your life progresses, you think to yourself, People like, you know, when I started studying Turkish, um, all my classmates were like, say, how did you remember so many words so fast? I'm like, what? Like, I don't know. I just looked at it a few times. You, you like underestimate how much creating that willpower, that focus, that, that routine, it affects every aspect of your life. I can get myself to fall into a schedule. I can get myself to fall into a routine like this because I started with creating, forcing myself. I'm not starting my day until I start my Quran. That changed my whole life. Because then everything started with Quran. And then I said, okay, well, well, I'm not doing anything until I do this, 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 this. You create this sense of willpower, a sense of routine, and it changes your entire life. So in summary, and I'll stop talking, sorry, um, is that um, creating a routine, creating a habit that, um, uh, you know, it could be the Quran, it could be Salah, it could be, you know, good uh, character, whatever it is. Find your goal, figure out a, ha a habit, routine, read more about it. It's okay if you don't know how to. It's something, a new experience. That's okay. And if you can walk away with build, you know, reading a few pages of Quran a day or praying two rakahs every night, whatever it is, do not underestimate. If you can carry this on for the next several months and years, you will have walked out of this experience entirely a new person in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inshallah. And, and, and really just something that you can look back and proudly say that at that time, this challenge, I was able to come out as a stronger person. Um, and with that, um, I'll go ahead and conclude. Jazakumul khairan. Thank you so much, Sister Tasneem. I really appreciated your words and I'm sure everyone learned lots from you today. Uh, most of all, I really appreciated how you mentioned that we should make goals for ourselves that are attainable. So oftentimes I find that when Ramadan begins, we decide that we're going to be the heroes this Ramadan. We're going to accomplish it all. We're going to, to um, read the Quran twice over and we're going to um, go above and beyond more than we usually do in our day-to-day -day life. And I think it was a really nice reminder from you that we really need to set goals that are attainable and that way we don't lose our motivation. So thank you for that. Great. I do want to share some comments on Facebook that I see. So continue, please, to post um, all of your thoughts and the gems that you are learning today on our Facebook page. Um, share the hashtags that we have, Ramadan Revival and Being Me 2020, please. So Reham Zia, I, I love your messages. So having a positive mindset can help us so much more than we know. It's just about how we look at things we face in life. Maybe a different Maybe different was needed for humans to be more mindful. Maybe we needed to take some time off from the world and focus on our families. We need to trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is no fault in his plan. So thank you so much for that comment there. I know you did have another comment that I also appreciated. Um, you said this is true on so many levels. It is crucial to have a routine. Set a schedule made and goals analyzed to have a successful Ramadan any day, month, year in general. 
um, I remember last Ramadan, I was working and oftentimes I would open my, my fast at, at work, you know, and I think that it's, uh, it's important to remember that maybe, although we, many of us are stuck at home, we're blessed with that opportunity to enjoy our Ramadan at home and have that opportunity to break our fast with our family. Um, a, lot of, a lot of us who have that ability to work from home, it is truly a blessing. Um, Shazia Khan, you wrote, doesn't matter how small the task is, having consistency in doing is the most important thing, inshallah. Very, very valid point, Shazia. Thank you for that. Um, Samina Mahmood writes, very good advice. So thank you. Uh, routine is key from Ami. Um, Solange wrote, try memorizing one ayah per day, every day, no excuses. Again, that, that's an attainable goal. I appreciate that. Um, Amna Khayyum wrote, I'm really thinking of doing this, doing two or three ayahs along with the rest of the routine during, this, during the day. It seems quite unattainable to me. So sorry, means quite attainable to me, I think is what, what she meant there. But thank you so much for your comments. So keep the comments coming. Um, we love to hear what everyone is thinking and your names will be entered in a draw as well. We will be selecting winners and, and sending some uh, email prizes too. So again, I appreciate that. And remember the hashtags being me 2020 and hashtag Ramadan revival. So without further delay, I do want to introduce our next speaker. Um, Ustada Tamia Zubair is an established teacher of Quran with a focus on tafsir and word analysis. She studied under her parents and scholars, Dr. Idris Zubair and Dr. Farhat Hashmi, founder of Al Huda International. She has been a student and a teacher at Al Huda Institute of various Islamic sciences, including Arabic grammar, Hadith, and Fiqh. Currently, Ustada Damia is completing her humanities degree with a, pre with a President's Entrance Scholarship at the University of Waterloo. She also teaches around the world for the Al Maghrib Institute. So once again, let's welcome Sister Damia Zubair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Uh, I want to begin with um, thanking and appreciating the Being Me team. Um, honestly, when I uh, found out about how the conference will not be taking place, I was quite sad because uh, this is something that I do look forward to every year, uh, meeting 